No, the question was we were looking at um, network analysis graphs that visualize which uh, citations and which publications are connected to each other and uh, the Amazonization that you get recommendations. Sure. Um, yeah. If you're interested in that, uh, the question was uh, whether you, you're planning to restrict this to Nature as a magazine and to Nature pub <coughs> and its publications or uh, whether you're going to open it up to the whole um, scientific publication world. So certainly as far as um, recommending blog posts to read that might be relevant to um, a paper that somebody reads. So for example, read a blog post about, about read a paper about this, and look, there's a relevant blog post. Um, we can already get that data by um, doing our aggregation, and so one of the ideal things that we would do is be able to recommend those, and so they wouldn't be restricted solely to NPG publications. Um, I'm not entirely sure what our policy is um, about uh, recommending papers themselves. I mean, we certainly discuss papers. We have blog bloggers who can blog about whatever they like on, on networks, so people are blogging about papers from other publications. You know, it's a strong issue. Mm. In the end, it's about company and, and business strategy because, I mean, how would you as a publisher recommend uh, articles and journals of other publishers? That is probably not the core of your business model, I would, I would say. Neither today nor tomorrow. <laughs> so um, maybe these network analysis tools probably die more in, in the hands of, uh, how can you say, independent uh, networks or. Uh, yeah, uh, the other publisher, the other and this is very important that the research gate is and stays independent. Um, we want to be someone who is, uh, you know, in contrast to all the publishers, um, and, and, and someone who is not, you know, this is why, you know, the investments which we took were not from any publishers. Uh, in the moment where you take money from one publisher, you start. Uh, you know, having some kind of a direction where the company has to move to. So, um, I want, you know, we want to create with ResearchGate a platform which is independent um, from the publishers exactly to achieve or to get uh, recommendations based on your interests and not based on that what is the best for the company. Of course, as long as it works, I mean, Biomed Experts, which is, I think, uh, the second largest Network has just been bought by Elsevier. So, um, who are you going to be bought from uh, <laughs> next year? <laughs> no, next <laughs> week? <laughs> no, you're not getting acquired. Definitely not. Okay. You don't want to. <laughs> no, I don't want to. I think we we want to create an independent company, and we are an independent company. And I think there's a chance for a company to change something in the world of science by being independent. Further well, questions? We have a few more minutes, 10 more minutes. We have to finish quite punctually. It's a good. Yeah. Is it possible to say which platform is the most successful about the building scientists? Which are using um, open science platforms? I think in the chat. So it's hard for me to say. First of all, it, ha it hasn't been it, it hasn't <coughs> been evaluated yet uh, empirically. Yeah. So that's that's the real answer to your question. And, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, and the question is, of course, um, to be fair, um, like if you compare Mendeley and ResearchGate, Mendeley is more focusing on, let's say, literature handling. Um, we're focusing more on the social networking part. Um, it's you know from the user base. You can, if you take the user base, I think you know then ResearchGate is the largest, followed by Mendeley. Um, but it's still hard. I think yeah. If from and how many? I think there were so many platforms which like three years ago uh, when we started, they were much bigger than than we were at that time. And now they are not anymore. They are, they just closed down, shut down. Um, I think yeah. There are some platforms, but they're very small. Scholars is very small. Um, yeah, lab meeting is just down. I saw that yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are some platforms, but I think ResearchGate was <laughs> is, is the largest <laughs> and the most widely used platform. Right? When it comes to the figures and the sheer numbers, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. I mean, there are there are platforms uh, which are dedicated to a certain subject. <coughs> and then I suppose I suppose Biomat is larger in the biomedical sphere uh, than ResearchGate when it comes to bio biomedical. Okay, <laughs> yeah. maybe or maybe not. Okay, yeah. can you can you Lou, uh, make an estimate how many German members of Nature Network are active? 
How many? Approximately? Okay, so uh, uh, um, all in all, you have how many members at the moment? So um, we say we have about 40,000. 40,000, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Further questions? things what he's using a lot. One is the uh, publication suggestions because it saves him time so he doesn't have to go through all the, you know, go to PubMed. Um, and also if you go to PubMed and you type in your keywords, you every time type in the same keywords mm -hmm. because it's your same behavior. In ResearchGate we take your publications and which you published and extracting keywords um, and make the suggestion based on what yeah, your behavior within ResearchGate. So you're getting papers which are different to that what you usually find. Um, this is what he's using. And the second thing is he's using it um, for his uh, research scholars and research students to share documents within groups in with the file sharing tool. So he says, you know, um, this is the presentation or Excel sheet and all this data. I want to share that with my scientists in a private secure group. So we have like private secure groups which are only open to the people who who were invited into this group. Um, yeah. So these are these functionalities. And um, it's interesting. I, I, in like three years ago, I talked to a lot of professors to get feedback. And one professor from Melbourne, he's now in Maastricht. His name is, and now the Germans will laugh. And in the US, the, the joke is not that funny. His name is Harald Schmidt. And <laughs> <laughs> but he really hates it. Yeah. So the second Harald Schmidt, who is a professor, and and in the beginning, I remember when I talked to him the first time on the phone, because I, at his, when we started, I did around, around the world trip to present at as many universities as possible with the idea of research gate. So I, I tried to find someone in Melbourne. And he said, you know, I don't think that, um, that research gate, you know, he didn't, didn't believe in the idea. And then I came and then I presented him this to him and it has grown over time and now he's using it very very active um, you can look for him his name is Harald Schmidt he has lots of I think 450 followers um, he's using it for recruiting finding scientists um, to for getting his, them to his lab and he's using it for getting feedback about um, about his new methods and new ideas uh, which he wants to use in his lab so if he's using a new technical method then he tries to uh, get feedback from the community before he starts buying these kits or buying these things. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just we just brought Mendeley up to the screen, which um, Ian earlier couldn't really introduce um, to us um, as far as you might be interested in it, because this is one tool where literature is being how can you say administered yeah. or collected and shared and. This is how you probably work as well as a scientist, so yep. you don't just um, put all your PDFs and all your, yep. your, your papers into a, a, a box in a folder where you have them on your home PC and when you're on the way you don't have them. But here you share them with your community, you say, um, I found something interesting, um, you give it certain tags, you say this belongs... Ex exactly, I mean every scientist now knows the problem of having all this paper and not sorted and everything, okay? So this, this mess on your hard disk basically, and you, you look through it, maybe you share them by some uh, recent online sharing tools or whatever, but Mendeley just goes through all your library and it tries to classify the papers, look and identify them automatically on your hard disk and links them to the online profile of this publication. And so you can tell other people what you're reading and you can see what other people are reading and it, so this generates some new measurements and you can then see uh, like who, which people read similar things and then you can get some suggestions for them or, or uh, 
get some other papers from them and you within your work group you can share your papers so you can mm -hmm. uh, apply and take your doctorate students so that they have the same you work on the same library or platforms like Bibsonomy for instance it's a colleague who actually wanted to come as well but you couldn't find the time the <coughs> um, it's like a delicious someone who you know yeah. delicious or Mr. Wong it's a yeah. delicious for science called Bibsonomy it's invented by the people who do the research in, um, in uh, business management knowledge management is that at the University of Kassel I think it was uh, developed and invented and um, they do more or less the same, but more on specific links and sources and um, yeah. data. Yeah, so, so Mendeley comes with a desktop tool where it, it integrates uh, into Word, for example, and you can cite the things mm -hmm. and you can uh, then just directly download your publication on different computers. So if you work at your office, you can have the same at your home and you stay in sync, basically. I think it even forces you more or less if you um, write an article to think very early on about tags, about abstracts, about yeah, yeah. Uh, metadata. So you, you can't really forget that, and that already brings you into an advantage again in comparison to all the other scientists who don't do. You just upload the text, and that's it. Yeah. So there again, you are. These texts will be lower in ranking; they will be lower um, in the in the search results. Whew. Yeah, complicated subject. Yeah, yeah. After all, it's, uh, it's, as I said, it's, uh, you want to say something? Oh, okay. I just want to say that there are a lot of tools out in the internet that yeah, are okay. growing, and some are some are go that are considered just Google for Science 2.0, and maybe Science 2.0 tools you will find a lot of lists. Some are free, some are companies, some are good, some are bad, some are developing, some are not, and it's a very vivid field at the moment. Yeah. But the first tools are already dying again, so this is, yeah. as far as I can see, it's always a, so we're not even in the first part of the hype, hype curve, we're already um, in a phase, whether we're in the middle or not is the question, but uh, the fact that the first platforms who have started quite ambitiously are already dying again shows that Science 2.0 is not such a new phenomenon and such a paradigmatic new thing after all. We have um, platforms with more than several hundred thousand members. Um, I think uh, I would like to close it here because time is up uh, anyhow and um, I hope that you've taken with you certain ideas and um, um, yeah, ways to do research, ways to um, uh, get an idea about the relevance of certain topics and um, I think it's a, a t an issue where we will have to dig d deep into for um, many more times before we uh, before it's, it's becoming part of our or of your daily work as uh, science journalists, as science communicators. But as a matter of fact, I think it is already transforming scientific practice um, more uh, fundamentally than any other development, than any other um, uh, general development in the last uh, years or even decades, I would say. Not Maybe not since the, the invention of peer review publishing, but uh, in that direction. So, um, thank you very much for being here. I hope um, the experts could... Um, did, uh, did you want to say something, <laughs> Lou? Sorry to exclude you. Uh, no, thanks very much for your And um, mm -hmm. if anybody has any further questions they want to follow up with, do feel free to share my contact details. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I, I hope we didn't leave you too far aside because it's always difficult when uh, some people just virtually there. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us from London, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, get well soon, okay? Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the for, for your for long way. Yeah. Um, here you have the new magazine of uh, Wissenschaftspressekonferenz. For those who don't have it yet, I think it's been published a few days ago. And um, a few brochures and magazines, and you find information about Telly, the Technische Literarische Gesellschaft on the internet, of course. Um, both Vipika and Telly have local groups here in Berlin. Quite small, huh, Manfred? About 20 members each, but still, um, yeah, thank you very much for being here and have a nice day and uh, enjoy the rest.